All right, so what is security compliance? To explain security compliance, my favorite analogy is the job of a car inspector. When you buy a car, before you can take it out on the road, I assume it needs to be inspected by an inspector. Now, I'm not sure exactly what these inspectors do, technically speaking, but I can imagine they have a checklist of some sort to make sure that the car meets compliance and is fit to be driven on the road. For example, the inspector checklist may include the following questions. Does the car have four wheels so it can be controlled on the road? Does the horn work to alert people? Are the windshield wipers rotating so you can see in the rain? Things like that. The point I'm trying to make is that whenever companies have an enterprise network, they have a certain set of checklists like a car inspector to follow. This checklist is based on the type of data that the network holds. Let's take the John Hopkins Hospital as an example. I'm sure part of the company mission goals involve the need to save files that contain patient medical records. It's safe to assume that they hold personal medical record data. Those medical records need to be protected from being leaked to an unauthorized party. An unauthorized party refers to someone that is not supposed to see them. Now, imagine your neighbor accidentally getting an email from your doctor that reveals that rash that you have behind you know who, what, where. You'd be pretty upset about that, right? Well, the government agrees that medical companies should be held accountable for how they protect patient medical data. So the government came up with the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA. The investment industries have a similar set of network security requirements called Sarbanes-Oxley Act, SOX. Financial institutions like banks, they have to follow their own technological requirements set by the Graham Leach Bailey, GLB Act. Nonetheless, I'm not going to discuss those compliance requirements in this course. The requirement we're going to focus on is called the Federal Information Security Management Act, FISMA. It was enacted in 2002. FISMA basically requires every network that holds federal data to address a set of security control requirements. Sort of like the car inspector analogy I mentioned earlier. Every network has a long checklist of security controls to check off before the network can be used. Now, I want you to check out this high-level federal government org chart here. It shows all the different departments within the federal agency. Each department you see here have multiple agency and sub-agencies. Many of these agencies have systems and each one is required to comply with FISMA. In a recent White House publication, the proposed budget for cybersecurity was almost $11 billion. That's out of $65 billion that's dedicated to federal IT budget. That's about $34 per person in the U.S. paying for federal cybersecurity. Now imagine how many cybersecurity analysts that money can buy. The point I'm trying to make is the federal government is big business. In fact, it's the biggest business in the world. So FISMA holds a good amount of job security. Now, how does a network become FISMA compliant? And who writes up these requirements? Well, I'll tell you. Under the Department of Commerce is an agency called the National Institute of Standard and Technology, NIST. This agency is responsible for making things standard for public use. For example, they make sure every light bulb has the same base size to fit into a standard sized light socket in your home. When FISMA came out and said all federal networks must now be secured in a similar manner, they commissioned NIST to provide the guidelines for all networks to follow. To simplify, think of the FISMA guideline in a nutshell as being processed into two halves. In the first half, I will refer to it as part one. This is where a security analyst will create a system security plan, SSP. The system security plan basically says, this is how we plan to keep our network secured. For example, it could say something like, we plan to force every user on the network to have a minimum of 14 character password before logging into their computer. In the second half, we'll call it part two, a different security analyst, often referred to as an assessor, will take that plan that the first analyst created and test it. This testing process is called a security assessment. In the same example where the plan says we must use 14 character passwords, well, the second analyst, aka the assessor, will literally go to the domain joint laptop and try to set up a 13 character password to see if the declaration in the SSP is true. This example is just one of many requirements. Once a network has addressed all applicable security requirements, it can receive its authority to operate, ATO. An ATO can be compared to how you need a driver license to drive your car. Sure, you can physically drive the car, but it's not legal, and you're taking an unknown amount of risk if you do. Every enterprise network that holds federal data is required to have its ATO. Without it, our tax dollars should not be used to support it.
See you in the next one.